Hi everyone and welcome to Autism Hope Library. I am just so excited to introduce our next guest. I have known her for several years and she is honestly an amazing, amazing person. But on top of being like one of the most amazing moms I know, she also is an amazing doctor out of Canada. So welcome Dr. Wendy Edwards. She is a consultant pediatrician and we're here talking about the basics of Autism 101. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Wendy. Oh, thanks, Kristen, for having me. It's so great to see you again. I love it. I just think that you and your family, aside of what you do in your professional life, you and your family are some of the most positive people and just, I just feel like you just spread hope and joy everywhere you go. So on top of that, you're this amazing doctor helping families. So I just think that's just, I don't know, it's a double star Grammy, whatever we want to call it, just awesomeness. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words. Well, before we get started, can you let people know, because I know you're out of Canada, what does a consultant pediatrician, like what does that definition, what does that look like? Okay, a little bit different than what happens in the US, I think. In Canada, we have kind of two types of pediatricians. So we've got your regular um, general pediatrician, which means it's kind of like a family doctor for little people. They will see anything and everything. Whereas a consultant pediatrician, and that's what I am, we don't own our patients. So we see patients that are sent to us by family doctors, or we go into the hospital if we're called in to emerge for special cases. So we are really specializing in pediatrics, not necessarily seeing coughs and colds, but seeing higher level issues in children. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't think we have, if we do, I don't know what it's called here. <laughs> but in the U.S. I don't think you do. No. I don't think we have. I think we just have pediatricians. And then if something is above what they think, they send us to a specialist um, based on that. Um, but I love that, especially when we're talking about autism, because as you know, and I know that the earlier that we get the diagnosis, um, not to say easier, but it really is easier in some, certain ways to be able to start the journey um, and be able to help our kiddos. And as you know, and I know, we believe we can help kiddos at any age. So if you're watching, we absolutely think at any age, but the earlier, that just means your journey gets to start sooner. And so today we're going to be talking about the basics 101 of autism. Here's a big question for you. What do you think causes autism? I love that question because I think you need to think about two things right away. You need to think about cause and you need to think about triggers. And I do think there is one basic cause based on the research, but there are a million different triggers. And that's why people always say, if you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism because their trigger is probably different. So if we wanna go right to the cause, I would say the cause most definitely is abnormal immune system function leading to inflammation in various areas of the body, specifically the brain for sure. Then the interesting part is what triggered that? And I think you can go all the way back to prenatal. There's lots of studies about maternal immune activation. So inflammation in a mother's body could potentially trigger a prenatal change. So you are potentially born with these changes and that is quote unquote your autism. It's always hard for me to say autism because it's a behavioral diagnosis, but I mean this inflammation change in the brain. Or maybe it's something that happened after you were born, because we talk about a lot of children who change very suddenly. So something has happened to them. So I think any trigger that could lead to inflammation, you probably already have some immune um, deficiency or abnormality, and then you are triggered by something. Um, for example, an infection, viral, bacterial, fungal, um, a toxin that gets into your system somehow, and there's so many more toxins in our world now than there ever were before. Um, things like almost like even an allergy, anything that will mount a big immune response, if your immune response is off, will lead to inflammation and lead to what I believe we are, we are interpreting as autism. I, yeah, I am a big believer in everything you just said, because it's like, I feel like people you know, they like to say the word autism, and it's true. If you met one person with autism, you've met one person because everybody is different. And some people have, you know, heavy metals. Some people have 
autoimmune is another area. Some people have dietary issues, which brings me to my next question. Is the diet really important when treating a child with autism? And if so, why? Well, in my humble opinion, it is absolutely vitally important. And I'll tell you, I think why is um, similar to what I just said. There is inflammation all over your body. All of us have that issue. But kids with autism have a lot of inflammation. And if you can calm down inflammation, even in one area, you're going to make a total difference to some degree. There's a percentage difference you're going to make. And the gut is the easiest to reach and easiest to affect in the area of inflammation. So if you are feeding someone um, a food, something that irritates their gut, bang, you're going to get immune activation down there. You're going to get inflammation. That's going to lead to leaky gut. That's going to lead to things in the bloodstream that the immune system again sees as foreign. You're going to get another attack on that. That's going to lead to more inflammation. And it's just this cyclic thing. So I think the gut is the easiest place to start treating inflammation and therefore start supporting your immune system. I'm totally in favor of um, a very specialized diet for kids with autism. And the diet's different. Some children need incredibly, incredibly specialized diets and others only need maybe a few changes. Mm -hmm. But it's not something where you can say, oh, I, I tried them off of um, wheat for two weeks and it made no difference. This takes time. You have to really, really try hard. And do you have like a special diet that you say, okay, we let's start here. And is there like a timeline to kind of give us an idea of when they might see some changes? Yeah, um, there are a lot of diets out there. Um, I try not to scare families with all the diets that are out there. I like them to always start gluten-free. Mm -hmm. I like them to at least um, stay away from liquid cow's milk. If we're talking casein, I like them to at least start there for various reasons. I mean, not just the inflammation, there's uh, folate reasons and other reasons. Um, I really, really ask them to cut back on chemical additives. So preferably no boxed foods, um, shop around the outside of the grocery store, get the real food. If you can afford organic, get organic. If you can't, just wash really carefully anything that you're going to feed them. Um, and sugars, oh my goodness sugar is just um, poison. So yeah. I try to stay away from that too. And I think those are just really, I, I don't actually think any of that's super hard today. I mean, my son and your son, obviously we've been doing this a little bit longer than if somebody's just starting today, right? And we right. remember, I mean, I know you remember because I do, <laughs> trying oh, to find something that was gluten-free 10 years ago even. It wasn't even as yeah. easy as it is today. So I feel like today, if you're starting a diet, it's, it's so much easier. <laughs> It's so much easier. Completely. It was almost impossible to find anything gluten-free back in those days. Yeah. And it's so easy now, for sure. You can and you know, gluten isn't enough and you have to go further, like specific carbohydrate diet mm -hmm. or something like that. But if you just start with the basics, it can be life-changing. Suddenly your child is sleeping. Suddenly they're not having meltdowns anymore uh, because their gut is healthier. It feels better. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids can't tell you when they don't feel good. And so their behaviors is what kind of shows you or they're pooping more or um, like, as you said, they're sleeping more or sometimes even their skin isn't like I see a lot of kids that have like red cheeks or they're kind of breaking out. Um, and, you know, I don't think that's normal. As a doctor, do you think that's normal? Absolutely not. And yeah. I think if you think about where that's coming from, uh, skin rashes and and the bumps and all those things are IgE medi mediated, and that's part of your immune system again. Your immune system's on high alert. Some people's immune system shows up a lot in their skin. We've had a lot of kids with eczema clear right up as soon as we clean up their diet. It's just, I, it's, to me, it's just so, so it makes me so happy to know as simple as just changing a diet, we can see so many great things um, for our kiddos. Um, and again, I keep saying it of any age, doesn't matter how old they are when you start this. Um, no. So let's talk about supplements. Do you have any favorite supplements you recommend the most to patients with autism? I do have a few that I think are 
easy to try and good basic um, building blocks for support of the immune system. Number one for me is probably vitamin D. I love vitamin D. It support, it's not only good for your, your bones and your teeth, which everybody used to know about, of course, but it's a really big supporter of your immune system. We also think it's probably incredibly important for detoxing hand in hand with your liver. So if you look at old, there's old studies out there about people who live in very sunny countries. There's a great study out of Hawaii and saying all these people in Hawaii who have all this sunshine all the time have very, very low vitamin D levels. And the thought is that we probably are using up a lot of our vitamin D so that our liver isn't working so hard to detox because the liver can, if the liver is detoxing, then it's not doing its other jobs. So you want it to work to keep you healthy in other areas of your, of your body, of your life. So you use up your vitamin D to detox. It's kind of a balancing act. So I'm shocked when I measure vitamin Ds, how pretty much everybody has a low vitamin D. So I really like to supplement that one um, fairly generously. And, you know, you can keep track by checking the, um, the levels in the blood work, but incredibly rare to overdose on vitamin D. Is it vitamin D3 or just vitamin D or is there a difference? No, you're right. It's D3. I should have made that clear. It's absolutely vitamin D3. So when you're doing your blood test, you're looking at 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And is there any other supplements or is that just your number one? Yeah. Go no, that's, that's my number one. Um, <laughs> I always try, especially if they're little, when I meet them, I always try, um, methylated folate so methyl tetrahydrofolate which i just love saying that fast methyl tetrahydrofolate um i always try that because there is the distinct possibility if you have immune problems that you're making antibodies all over your body autoimmune antibodies against things and it's very very common and we only have one study so far but very common for kids to have blocking or binding antibodies to their folate receptors so they're not getting folate into their brains and they're not developing neurologically like they should. If you think about all these children who are often diagnosed somewhere between 18 and 24 months of age, around that time, you're talking more, you're moving more, you're developing your fine motor skills. You need more folate because your brain is growing like crazy. If you're not getting that folate because you've got an antibody sitting in that receptor, you're in trouble. If you give methylated tetrahydrofolate, that doesn't need a receptor. That will go right into the brain and into the neurons. So you can bypass that blockage that potentially is there. It's also, when you look at folate, folate breaks down. If you're taking folic acid and a vitamin, or even if you're doing the best thing and eating your green leafy vegetables, there's several breakdown products before you get to methylated tetrahydrofolate. And it's been proven in studies that a lot of moms who have autistic children and a lot of autistic children are missing the enzyme to make that final product of folate 100% in your body. So maybe you're only at 60% or 40% or whatever. You can give extra folate. It's very easy to do. I've had children come to me at about 18 months who are on the waiting list to get seen for their diagnosis of autism by a psychologist. And we start the folate. By the time they finally get in to see the psychologist, they don't look like they have autism anymore. So wow. I always try folate, always. And what if the child's a little bit older? What do you recommend? I mean, let's say a parent's watching right now and they've never heard of that. And I don't know, they have a child that's 12, 15, 17, 22. You know, is it too late? No, it's always worth it. Because once you get folate in there, you probably will have some neurological development and then you can stop folate later. Like once you get the development, you're never gonna lose it. So mm -hmm. you just need that folate to help your neurons develop. It's of course better to do it as younger as you can, but it's never too late to try it for sure. I love and that. And then I have a third favorite, which is actually not a supplement, it's, it's a medication, but it's the most benign medication in the world. It's Nystatin. I don't know if you ever used that. Uh -huh. Yes. I use that for a long time with my son when he was little mm -hmm. and I still use it. Um, most recent research, I mean, we know about bacterial dysbiosis in children's guts with mm -hmm. autism, but the recent research is saying, aha, we also have uh, yeast dysbiosis, quite significant yeast dysbiosis. 
Nystatin is so benign, it goes in one end and down the tube. It doesn't absorb into the body. It doesn't harm anything. And I think it takes um, a big load off the stress in the gut. I think it really reduces yeast levels, therefore reducing inflammation down there. I have seen children change dramatically on Nystatin. So I always do that. I used to do it only for kids where in their history or their physical exam, I was worried about yeast. But um, I've had a couple of experiences in the last probably five or 10 years where this child appeared to have no gut problems at all, but I'm running out of ideas. Let's just try Nystatin and oh my goodness, huge changes. So it's always worth a try. Yeah, Jackson's on Nystatin and has been on and off for a good portion. It, feel like, it feels like his life, to be honest. Um, but and it doesn't matter how clean the diet is or anything. It's like we were just constantly battling. And you know me, I'm a big believer in diet. So our diet is hardcore clean. And I just couldn't figure it out. And his doctor was like, yeah, let's try this. And I can tell you, once we... When we've taken away, taken it away from him, you know, stopped it for a t- time. I can tell a difference. I really can. So it's, yeah. And if you think about it, your your gut um, microbiota, so your bacteria, your viruses, your your yeast that live in your gut, are going. If they were abnormal at the beginning, you can adjust it and change it with things, but it's always going to try to get back to its norm. So. Mm-hmm. You know, the yeast may go away, but the yeast will probably come back to some degree. So Nystatin, chronically long-term, on and off, is not a dangerous thing to use and can be really beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, I have another question. What do you see as the most exciting thing on the horizon for the future care or treatment of autism? Two things, two things that I'm really, really excited about. And the number one, I guess, that people are probably most aware of is the fecal matter transplants. I think those are amazing for all the reasons we've just said. Um, If you have an abnormal gut, if you have abnormal bugs growing down there, and it's been proven time and again that children with autism do, and we're not successfully getting them out of there or changing them, fecal matter transplant is about the only way to completely change that environment. It's not available to us yet, Um, at least as a medical treatment, it's not completely available to us yet. I know there are some clinics doing it, but medicine hasn't accepted it yet for autism. But um, Dr. Jim Adams' work and his colleagues um, in Arizona, it's just amazing what they did. And even two years later, they're still seeing huge changes in the children who actually had that fecal matter transplant done. Well, I know because Dr. Fry is doing that as well, and what, and I think he's in Arizona. Um, you know, I was reading some of their stuff, and it doesn't even matter on the age. It seems like if they have, you know, it didn't matter if the child was young or older. I'm so excited about that. I think that one is something that makes so much sense. I mean, nobody likes to say fecal matter transplant. Everyone goes, oh, but the way they're doing it, honestly, it's not, I mean, it's not gross. It really isn't, and it's... Ooh. You know, but when you first hear that word, you go, oh, goodness, like, I don't know about that. But when you actually read about it and you understand the, the meaning behind it and, you know, the, the potential for our kiddos, especially our kiddos that have their microbiome completely in disarray, which I feel like majority of our kids do, especially the kids that have the autoimmune issues with the inflammation and we're doing everything. And these are kids that, you know, maybe they've tried hyperbaric and they've tried diet and they've tried heavy metal chelation and you name it. And yet it's kind of like autism is like this, but you have all these little, little circles, right? And so they had this issue, they had this issue, they had this issue and the parents are going after that one. That one's gone, but now these three, this, this one made that one rise up higher. And then you go after that one. And before you know it, you're like, oh my goodness, but that's what an autoimmune issue is. And so when you hear about this treatment potentially coming to us, oh, I am just, I just hope you know, that the U.S., you know, doesn't poo-poo it, for lack of a better word. <laughs> I feel like it would be such a great thing, but I feel like Canada might be ahead of us on this at some point because I feel like you guys are more open-minded. <laughs> we have a lot of fecal matter transplant going on um, out west right now, particularly, but other places too, um, still just for C. difficile, but amazing changes being done. And I know Australia is doing a lot with fecal matter transplant too. 
But I think, you know, with Jim Adams' study coming out two years later and saying, look at these children have not lost any of the gains they made. Mm -hmm. And the kids who made the gains were making like 50% gains, huge gains. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. So I think it's definitely exciting and definitely something to look for in the future. You had two, was that the first one? What was the second one? Oh, the second one is Dr. Navio's work, which okay. you are probably familiar with. So that is called the cell danger response. Mm -hmm. And he has a, a, um, a theory, a hypothesis that would, it, it'd be a whole new paradigm for understanding disease, not just autism, but really any chronic disease. And especially a lot of the autoimmune diseases that are just rampant in our North American countries now. So he talks about the cell danger response where you have a cell that is happily making its ATP for energy and therefore the cell internally is doing what it's supposed to do and everything's great. Well, if the body is stressed and it doesn't just have to be an infection stress, it can be a psychological stress and you're releasing cortisol. It can be an infection, it can be an allergy, it can be a toxin, it can be one of many things. There's those triggers again, and this might be why different triggers cause autism. These triggers then cause the ATP, instead of staying in the cell and making energy, to go out of the cell and kind of lock arms outside of the cell and form a barrier kind of around it and say, no, you can't get in and destroy the cell. We are in fight or flight mode and we're not going to let you in. Well, if that's happening, there's no communication going on between cells. Um, they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They are not developing. They are not growing. Um, it's it's a terrible thing to happen. And now it's a normal condition and that's how the body protects itself when a stressor comes in. But normally then the stressor goes away and the body stops doing this. His theory is that it's this fight or flight mode in these cells that never goes away. And he has done some amazing, amazing trials uh, giving the sleeping sickness med, Suryaman, to uh, a group of kids who for the time being that they got it, totally changed. Like mm -hmm. nonverbal, older, older children and young adults mm -hmm. talked. I saw and that. then mm -hmm. when the infusion was done, boom, they went back into their cell danger response. I think that is phenomenal. And he could change, he could change medicine completely if they would listen to this, because I think his theory is amazing. And he's proven that it works. And, and, but you can't get, you can't get what he was giving though. That's the thing. And it's not even like that expensive from what I read. It was just the regulations, right? Yeah. 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 And I'm not sure actually why you can't get it anymore because it was certainly working and, and certainly fine. Now yeah. he, he does say that, you know, he thinks there are probably other things, um, potentially herbs and other supplemental things that would work as well as that drug did. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, where he's still working. I hope so. I hope he doesn't give up on this because to me, that that could be, not could be, it would be life-changing for everybody that especially, you know, I think what happens is a lot of people with autism that are higher functioning, for lack of a better term, if you're watching this, please, I'm not trying to offend. I know there's different labels. Nobody likes that. But just for, you know, for the sake of this conversation, um, that, you know, that are, you know, tax paying citizens and, you know, have jobs and are married and doing amazing. Like those people in that category, you know, are, that are doing great. Oh my gosh. If my son was like that, I wouldn't be worried at all. I'd be like, great. That's fantastic. But for the ones that we're talking about or the ones that might not have any language for the most part, um, or limited language, um, can't live on their own, you know, aren't able to carry or hold a job, are gonna need assistance for majority, if not all of their life. Um, these are the ones like my son that I'm worried if I die before him, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, you know? And so for me, when you look at those kids of any age, oh my gosh, it makes me teary eyed thinking about it because I'm like, oh, I'm so excited if something like this could totally change the outcome of their life and they could be having a family or potentially or job or living on their own oh my gosh, why would we not do this? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you know, a really interesting point that he brings up when he um, lectures about this is that you need to think outside the box and not just think about medications because this is a fight or flight thing. 
if you can also offer these people with autism very supportive, um, engaging, calm um, therapy, counseling, but where you're calm, where there's no pressure, the fight or flight feeling can go down and that can potentially help this as well. And I think that's why certain, um, um, and you and I know how we feel about this, certain behavioral therapies mm -hmm. work better than others. Yes, absolutely. I just, uh, I get so much hope just listening. I already knew about that study and yet you reminded me of it and gave me, a, I don't know, gave me even more hope in my belly and makes me all happy to think about because I feel like if it's not this doctor, which I hope it is, I hope he continues his work. I know he was looking for um, funding, you know, for that. But if he doesn't finish the work, I'm hoping somebody else picks it up because it's there. And what that reminds me of is that we know it's possible. And if we know it's possible, it's going to happen. We just don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know what herb, we don't know what medication, whatever it is, it's out there. And I get excited because I think, okay, it doesn't matter the age because I have an 18 year old and they used to say, ah, oh, if they weren't talking or doing this by the age of four, and then it was age of six and the window closes, blah, blah, blah. You know what? That's just baloney. That's true. Yeah. And so I don't believe any of that. And, you know, with my son just recently was able to take a shower by himself. Like he learned how to turn the hot and cold on and make his bed. And, you know, I'm sorry, that is so darn exciting. And, you know, I remember when they said that wasn't possible. And then talking to somebody like you, oh, hearing these amazing things that could be out there. And it's closer than we think. It really is because time goes like that, as we know. And so you know, thank you for all the work you're doing. And gosh, are those parents lucky that get to see you, I got to say. <laughs> I feel like all the parents that get to go. Now, how do people find you? How, I don't know how it works in Canada. How does it work if somebody wants to come see you? Well, it's, it's a problem these days, right? Because mm -hmm. there's only uh, kind of one of me doing yeah. this where I am. So I have a bunch of clients that I've had over the years. They were referred to me. Um, some of them are local, a lot of them are outside in my province, um, a few of them are worldwide, uh, but my list is kind of closed now because uh, it just gets overwhelming. I, I know what you, you know what that's like. Yeah. Yeah, so, but there's doctors like her out there, and maybe, you know, you, and we have a lot of doctors on our library. They're all great. Uh, MedMaps doctors are also great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, there's only one of you, and I wish we had more of you. <laughs> but I love the one that we do have is you. <laughs> I keep trying to get those med students excited, so. Well, that's, maybe. you know, and that's what we need. We need the future, we need the future doctors to get super excited and so that way you know like i said if another doctor stops this research another doctor can pick that up or a scientist can pick that up and i think that's so crucial now for families watching that might feel like well i don't know how they can't feel i don't know how they can feel helpless or hopeless at this point but let's just say they do still because i feel full of hope right now but for those that are watching that just feel you know gosh a little scared you know, maybe they're new to the diagnosis. Maybe they've been around a while, but they've never heard of anything like this and their child is older. What message can you give to them? Well, I think number one, age does not matter at all. Doesn't matter at all. I know a 52 year old man who started talking at 52. Age doesn't matter. So don't just give up thinking your child has reached a certain age. Number two, just get through the moment. If you worry and worry and worry about the future and, and he or she won't do that or he or she won't do that and they told me this, they don't know. They don't live with your child. They only know what they've seen up to date. The people who are being negative and telling you it won't happen are not the people who are looking at the research studies in autism. They're not excited about autism. They don't understand. They're not on the forefront. So Go to your meetings and smile and nod. Thank them very much for their negative viewpoint. And then go home and realize all the things that your child can do right now. When Patrick was little, I had a little calendar by the phone. And every day, if anything happened that was different, like for you, for Jack's, Jack's turned on the shower by himself. Mm -hmm. I would write that down there. And then I would go back and flip through past calendars and say, remember when that was a big deal? And now that happens every day. It's, I mean, you just need to hang on to that. 
And when you're having a bad day, all you need to do is get through the moment Mm -hmm. because the next moment will be better. I love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy, for being here today and uh, giving so much hope to all the families that are watching. And just thank you for being you. I just adore you. And I think you're just so awesome. So thank you for being here today. (laughs) I adore you too. And for everyone watching, just remember what Dr. Wendy said, you know, it doesn't matter the age and just remember there is hope and just get through the day because tomorrow's a new day. So until next time, bye guys.